All right, so this is uh, another in the uh, set of bite-sized bioinformatics talks. And today I am going to have a look at how we can get data out of the public sequence repositories. So these are particularly for the um, high throughput sequencing experiments. So we're talking about uh, repositories like GEO and the short read archive. So I'm gonna go through and show you a few different options for how you can extract raw data out of those repositories repositories today uh, at different scales depending on what your requirements are. I'm going to share my screen now and sort of walk you through the process that you uh, would go through if you were actually uh, looking at a paper and wanted to get the data out from that. So if I just switch across to here, then what I'm going to start from is actually uh, from PubMed. Uh, the repository that has uh, published papers in it and I'm just going to do a search for a paper so uh, this is going to search for um, in theory any paper but this one I happen to know has uh, some sequencing data in it so if I link through to this I can go through to the PubMed page for this and then eventually through to the actual uh, journal article itself. And it's been true for some time now that if you wanted to uh, publish a paper and as part of that paper you uh, used high throughput sequencing or indeed many different high throughput uh, techniques that part of the condition of publication in pretty much every journal these days is that you have to make your raw sequence data available um, through a freely available public repository so that other people can either validate the results you've got using your own data or reuse your data for questions that they may, may wish to uh, address. And this is a hugely valuable resource and at Babram we've been um, using this data at a heck of a rate. Over the last couple of years we have done more work on public data that we have pulled down and reprocessed than we have on new data that we've generated. We have reprocessed a huge amount of public data. Um, so this is something that's really worth uh, getting into and being able to uh, utilize. When you have a paper that incorporates some of this, it'll be placed in slightly different places in the journal, uh, in the article, depending on the journal uh, and their style. But somewhere there will be um, a table that says where all of their data is available. So in this particular journal, um, it's at the end of the method section, they have a resources table. And if I scroll down through this, then when I get to the sequencing data, I've got a section here that says deposited data. They did some microarray experiments, which I'm not going to touch for this, but they did some sequencing data as well. So raw and analyzed sequencing data. And in line with most uh, papers that use this facility, they've deposited this into the GEO database, the Gene Expression Omnibus. Okay, this started out as a microarray database, but it's now expanded uh, to hold uh, data from sequencing experiments now. So typically what you're looking for in your papers is the geo accession, which will have this form here. So GSE and then a number. And you can either just copy and paste that number uh, and put it into the search box on the NCBI geo website, or from this journal, I can just um, follow the link directly to open up the corresponding geo entry so that I can see it. Okay, so this is our immediate gateway to the data that they've deposited for this paper. On the GEO uh, project page here, uh, I've got a load of data about the uh, experiment that they've done. So this is all of the sort of metadata just describing the study that they did, what the design was, who did it, links back to the paper, all of this sort of metadata, um, some details about who submitted it and when. And then underneath that, I've got the details of what type of data this is. So this is sequencing data generated on the Illumina HiSeq 2500 platform and the list of samples that they've deposited. And here there are five samples in this particular study. OK, so this is the data that's um, available to me from here. Now, from a geo accession, there are three different types of data that I can potentially get out. Okay, and two of those are directly downloadable from this page, and one of them isn't. 
Uh, and unfortunately, the one that isn't is the one that most often is what we want. So the three different types of data that we can get, this bit down here where it says download family, what we have in here are different reformatted versions of the metadata for this study. So really all of the sort of stuff that we saw up here, plus the details for the samples, so the details of the experimental conditions or whatever annotation people have chosen to put on them. So there's a few different formats in there um, that you can download this in, but there's no actual experimental data there. It's the descriptive metadata for the study which you can get out of there. The second type of data that we can get from here is that when you submit your data to GEO, as well as having to deposit the raw sequence data itself, you are also required to deposit some kind of quantitation for your data. So down in the bottom part on here where it says supplementary files, you will get at least one and sometimes more than one uh, additional sort of file that you can download from here. And this will be the quantitative data that the submitters have put in alongside the raw sequence data. There is pretty much no standardization as to what this data has to be. Uh, GEO have some recommendations for what they say you should do, um, but really they are very flexible about, well, as long as you've put something in, they'll be happy about this. So you just have to read the description uh, in the metadata to find out what this is. For this particular study, uh, they've deposited this thing that says GSE 97379 underscore raw, it's not actually raw data, it's raw quantitative data. And this particular data set is uh, WIG files. So WIG files are um, a running quantitation uh, across the genome to give a kind of running total of uh, reads as you go across. But you can get a huge variety of things in here. Um, some things will be count tables, some will be normalized expression values, um, some may be peak calls, it can be almost anything. This kind of data can be a really useful shortcut uh, to getting at the data because you don't need to do any processing. You can just take the numbers straight out of here, uh, but you just get what they've given you and you get no choice about that. So if you want to go back to the original data and process it in a way that you have controlled to be able to get at the quantitations that you want, uh, then this isn't going to be the way to go. We're going to want to go down to a one level further back from that uh, and look at the actual raw sequence data that was deposited because from that then we can um, reprocess and do whatever it is that we like from that. Um, GEO itself doesn't hold sequence data. GEO is a repository for metadata and it's a repository for the uh, quantitations that people have submitted. For the actual raw sequence data you actually need to go to a different linked repository which is the short read archive. So somewhere on the GEO page here in this case will be a link to the corresponding short read archive entry for this geo entry and the short read archive is what will actually contain the sequence data so that's where we're going to go and get our sequence data from. I just want to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about the different types of accession that you'll see because as we're stepping through this we're actually going to go through a few different levels of um, annotation and accession codes. And they're sort of all interrelated uh, in some way. So it's worth sort of understanding the relationship between GEO and SRA and the different subdivisions of those. Because you can see in here that we've got a link from GEO to some GEO samples, and then we've also got a link to SRA. There's also a link to this thing called BioProject, Bio which I'll mention in a second as well. But let's start off just by going through uh, the relationships in GEO and SRA. So this is a, a quick summary of the different types of accession that you might see, the database that they come from, and the relationship that they have. Okay, so the one that we've seen already are GSE accession, so they start with GSE and then some number after that, and those are GEO studies, and that generally will be what uh, you get published in uh, the paper that you get. So that's normally your entry point into this. And that will have a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, an SRA project. Okay, so we just saw that link off the main geo page. So there will be a corresponding SRA project. 
GSE samples uh, studies then have samples in, so GSM values are geo samples, and SRA projects have what are called SRA experiments, so SRX uh, accessions, and again, one SRA study will have many SRXs, one GSE study will have many GSM samples, and there will again be a one-to-one -one correspondence between a GSE geo sample and an SRA experiment. Okay, so you can either get to these by going across to SRA and down into the SRX, or across to the GSM and down into the SRX that way. The place that actually holds the data though is a final accession, which is an SRR accession. So this is an SRA run. So this is designed to represent one actual sequencing experiment. So one run of your sequencer or one lane of uh, a sequencer. Quite often there will be a single SRR accession associated with an SRX accession, because for a lot of samples, you're only going to do one lane of sequencing per sample. But sometimes you will see multiple lanes of sequencing if they've sequenced to a higher depth or they split things across lanes. Sometimes they will have multiple um, runs for the same experiment. And it is the run then that holds the sequence data itself, which is what we ultimately want to get to. So we're going to have to navigate through these sites, starting from here, either going across and down that way to get to the sequence data, or via the SRA and across that way. Okay, And it doesn't really matter which of those we do, we end up in the same place. So in this instance, if I open up one of the geo samples in here, I see a whole load more metadata, which tells me a bit about, in this case, the genotype of the sample, the details of how it was pre uh, prepared, how the library was made, what type of data it is, um, again, how it was sequenced, and for the uh, process data that was uh, uploaded before the WIG file, uh, some details of how that was generated. Okay, so all of that metadata is in there. And near the bottom of this, we then have a link through to the individual WIG file for this sample. So we could have got them all from the GSM file, but we can get the individual quantitative ones on uh, the, uh, sorry, on the GSE, but we can get the individual ones on the GSM file. And then we can go across to the SRA, which will hold the actual um, sequence data. This now gets us to the SRA experiment. So again, a whole load of metadata that really repeats what we've already seen uh, before. But at the bottom of that, then we can see the actual sequencing runs. Okay, so in this case, we had two separate runs for this uh, sample. So there are two sets of FASTQ files that we want to download. And if I follow the link for either of these, we'll get to the, the actual page for the run where we can start to see the details about, okay, there are 10 million uh, reads in this, how many bases come up, what's the total size of the file and various other bits, okay. Now, getting FASTQ data out of a database which is designed to store FASTQ data, you would think would be a simple process, but oh boy, is it not. So we're going to look at how to do this, but I warn you, this is going to be a slightly painful journey. So we're going to show you a few different routes through this, um, but it is not the easiest thing in the world. And I completely understand people who get frustrated with trying to get data out of here. Now that we're on a particular run, helpfully there is a download link at the top and it says download FASTQ, okay, which is exactly what we want. So that would appear to be a nice way to get at this. Unfortunately, if you click on that, despite the fact that we are in a particular run already, when you go to it, all you get is dumped into a search box um, where you can't even put the run identifier in here. What you would need to put into this stage is the experiment, the SRX number. So if I go back and find the SRX number, okay, which is the one that was down here, I can put that into the download search box. And now it gives me the list of the files and it says, what format do you want? <laughs> FASTQ is not the default, but I can make it FASTQ and I can pick a file and I can say, yep, yeah, great, let's go and download that. And it gives me a file to download, okay? Which seems okay, 
but don't do that. Okay, so even though this is the link that NCBI sends you to, and even though you can go through and it will download a FASTQ file, you almost certainly don't want to do it that way. Um, just to illustrate why, I've actually downloaded this FASTQ file onto my machine. So here I've got that SRA data FASTQ file. And it is a FASTQ file, uh, but it's a slightly weird one in that the experiment that we were looking at, the sequencing in here was paired end sequencing, which means that for every um, biological molecule, so for every insert in our library, we generated not one sequence, but two. Okay, so you did one sequence coming from one end of the insert going into it, and then you do another one which comes from the opposite side. It does a reverse complement read coming back. And when you sequence that out of an Illumina sequencer, you get a pair of FASTQ files. You get two separate FASTQ files where the two paired reads are in equivalent positions in the two files. And pretty much every downstream application is going to expect your data to look like that. But if you use that route, which is the main download link you see from NCBI, um, if I have a look at this, this is what the data is. So it is a FASTQ entry. So this sort of four lines is the standard uh, FASTQ entry. What they've done is, is uh, instead of giving us two FASTQ files back for the read one and read two sequences, they've stuck them underneath each other in the same file. So this is read one. So this 1.1 is read one for this. And then 1.2 here, this is read one, those four lines, and this is read two for that same entry. So before you're going to be able to do anything with this, you're going to have to separate alternate read pairs into separate files to be able to do anything with it, which is nuts. Um, so although that link exists, I would strongly recommend not using it. Okay, so even though that seems like the obvious way to go through this, and even though you go to the download link and that's where it sends you, that isn't going to be an ideal way to get your data out of here. So let's look at some other options and some ways which are better than this. A really useful thing to know is that the short read archive is not the only place that you can get the read data um, out of GEO or even indeed out of SRA. Um, there are three main sequence databases around the world. In America, you have the NCBI databases, which is their, their big sort of repository for all of this data. Um, in Japan, you have the DNA database of Japan, DDBJ, and they take a copy of all of this public data. And in Europe, you have uh, the EBI and the European Nucleotide Archive, which also mirrors all of this data. So all of these files are available available from these different mirror copies around the world. And we can make use of this. So if I go back to my geo entry here, and I'm just going to copy my GSE identifier, I can then move to the uh, European Nucleotide Archive. So I can go to ebi.ac.uk slash ENA which is the European Nucleotide Archive. And if I search for that geo identifier in here, it will think for a second and then it will find it, okay? And it finds, the, finds it under its SRA uh, identifier, but that's fine because it's the same thing. And even though it's the same data and accessed from the same accession, in the European version of this uh, database, we have direct links to the FASTQ files. So here are all the samples. This is a paired end sequence file, and I've got a link to file one and file two. So instead of giving me this horrible conflated FASTQ file, I can now just click on one of these files and it will directly download it. Okay, so I could work my way through here uh, and download these files, and those will be pre extracted FASTQ files, separated read one and read two, and a direct download from here. Okay, so on a small scale, this is a really easy way to do it. Um, even here, there are some sort of weird things. Uh, you see all these sorts of accessions and stuff on here, okay, where they've got the primary accessions, secondary accessions, run accessions, all the things that we were talking about. Um, weirdly, they have seem to have decided that the one thing that you don't need to see on this uh, table is the actual sample name. So although you've got all of the accessions, you don't actually have the name that they were put under in there. If you want to see the sample name, you need to go to the thing that says 
select columns and down here, I think it's sample title, which you can then turn on and then it actually tells you which sample is which. Okay, so a bit of a faff. Now, clicking through these one at a time, if you've only got a few samples or a couple of samples, sure, you can go and do it that way. But normally you want to be able to download things uh, on a slightly larger scale. So maybe I want all of the data from this study. And the ENA has a reasonably nice solution for that too. So if I look back across on here, there's a link on here that says bulk download files. And what this will do is it actually kicks off a local Java application. So it launches a Java web start application. And if I open that, you need to have Java installed locally on your machine. And if you do, then it will launch a small Java application that looks like this, where all of the samples for the uh, study that we were looking at will be listed. You can then set a local folder on here. So I can say, uh, let's save this onto my desktop and I'll make a folder called ENA. And then I can pick the samples that I want to have and then just start downloading. And that will then download all of the samples into that folder. It will validate that they're all all right. And I can get all of the data relatively straightforwardly. You can see it's starting downloading already. Okay, I'm going to stop that because I don't want to wait for that all to finish. So on a medium scale, this is a really nice solution. Okay, so it takes very little uh, infrastructure on your side. It's nice and friendly. You just press the button um, and your data comes down. There are some problems with this as well though. So this is obviously a desktop application. So you've got to have something that can run this little graphical downloader. So you're going to need to be able to do that. So you're going to need to sit and wait whilst it downloads. And for big studies, there could be an awful lot of data to download. So it's going to take quite a while to do that. Also, the files that you get in the end are just going to have names like this. So they will just be the accession code um, followed by the read number and then fastq.gz. So relating that back to the metadata and all of the sample name so you can figure out which one's actually which is going to take a bit of tinkering on your part. Okay, So this is much better than what they had at NCBI, but it's still a little clunky depending on the scale at which you want to do this. Let's look at a third option then. And a third option is a tool that was built to make downloading data from the EBI easier. So the tool we're going to look at um, is called uh, SRA Explorer. And it was written by Phil Jules, who works at SciLife Lab in Sweden. And he obviously got as frustrated with this as everybody else did. So it's at sra-explorer.info. And this isn't a place that you can download sequences, but it's a, a, a website that allows you to um, create a little script that will do that download for you and will solve a lot of the problems that uh, we've talked about on some of the previous methods. So SRA Explorer is just a website where you can go and stick an accession code in here and get a list of samples. Okay, so for example, they show you that you can put a GSE number in here um, and it will search and show you all of the samples that are associated with that GSE number, which is great. Except of course that the madness from NCBI isn't over yet in that that works just fine. But if I take the GSE number that I've got from this study that we're looking at now, and I clear this and I put that GSE number in and I search, I don't see any samples at all. Okay, it doesn't work. It's not the fault of SRA Explorer. SRA Explorer is querying the web service at NCBI to say, here's a GSE number, tell me all the samples it's got. And the NCBI database is just flat broken and has been for some time. That sometimes it works and sometimes the back end query just tells it that there are no samples underneath that. G, uh, GSE number. There's an easy fix once you know this, which is that if you go back to your geo page and for that geo entry, you find your SRA identifier. And if I take that and I put that into SRA Explorer, then 
the web service correctly identifies it and finds the samples that are under it. Okay, the SRA Explorer is absolutely doing the right thing and the NCBI's back-end systems are giving it nonsense results sometimes. Once you know that though, then SRA Explorer is lovely. So you get the list of samples, um, it's pulled out some of the relevant names and stuff so that you can see what they are and you can choose the samples that you want to download or you can just tick all of them and say you want all of them. You then add them to your collection of saved data sets and once you've got all the samples that you want, you can click on your little checkout cart up here. And what it will then give you is um, a number of different things that you can download. So, for example, under here, it will give you the direct downloads to the FASTQ files. Okay, so these are the direct FTP links to the files that you can download. More usefully, though, um, you can download a bash script for downloading the FASTQ files, okay, which is just a series of curl commands, but that will not only download the files, it will also write them out into a file name that has the SRA identifier in it, the GO identifier, the originally submitted sample name, the species that it came from, the type of data that it is. Okay, so things that are going to help you identify uh, the right. Um, sample once you've got to that stage and you can just copy all of this paste that into a script file run it on your cluster or on your server and all of this data will then download um, I'll just take one of these just so you can see how it works uh, I'll try and get all of it so if I copy that I can then go to uh, our cluster on here I can put that into there. It'll then download that data and fairly quickly it will uh, pull the whole thing down, save it under the name that uh, it was given in there and that will work pretty efficiently. It's going to be great for me because this is downloading from Cambridge so this connection I'm doing is going about five miles up the road so we've got a super fast connection and it will just work really nicely. So as a simple way to do it then putting your data into um, SRA Explorer, getting the list of download URLs from there and using their little bash script in your, on your Unix machine to pull all of that data down is a really convenient way to do it. Let's go back though and look at um, the sort of official method that um, NCBI recommend for doing downloading of their data. So I'm going to go back to the geo page here. The official method for getting at large amounts of data from the short read archive is that the NCBI produce a piece of software called the SRA Toolkit. And the SRA Toolkit has tools in it that directly let you download data from the short read archive straight to your machine. Okay, So if I go and have a look, I can look for SRA. So if I just look for SRA Toolkit Download, I'll find their um, GitHub I.O. page uh, that tells you how to install and configure this. So there are links here straight to pre-compiled binaries for most of the uh, common operating systems that you're going to want. So uh, oh, actually, no, that's a link straight to it. Uh, but down here, it'll show you that you've got links to um, either the uh, Unix versions of this uh, and it supports uh, both CentOS and Ubuntu. Also you can get it for uh, Mac OS and you can get it for Windows. Okay so here you go from their download page here. These are all the pre-compiled binaries that you can get for different platforms. Okay and installing it is as simple as just unzipping that file and putting that uh, directory of uh, scripts into your path. Um, one other thing that uh, you should be aware of with this uh, is that another slightly mad thing that you have to do with this before you can run any of the programs in this if you keep scrolling all the way down after testing the toolkit configuration and keep going down there's a thing at the end that says configuring the toolkit and it says if you're using SRA toolkit version 2.4 or higher and you will be now so we're up to something way bigger than that that before you can 
run any of the tools in the toolkit, you need to run this command, this VDB config minus I, which is an interactive config. So you can't run this as part of a script. It has to be in an interactive session on a terminal. And it will run and it will open up a page that looks like this. And without interacting with this page in any way, you can just immediately exit and then it will have set up the configuration file that will then let it run. But until you've done that, none of the tools in the toolkit will run. So you only need to do it once, but the first time you've installed it, you need to be interacting with a terminal, run VDB config minus I, let the interface open, immediately exit the interface, and you're good and done. So once you've got that though, it then gives you access to tools that will let you download data directly from the short read archive. So let's have a look at doing that. Okay, so my little download from uh, the SRA Explorer has now finished. So there's my FASTQ file straight out of there. Okay, so that's one method and that works. For the downloads uh, from NCBI directly, then the program that we're going to use from the SRA toolkit. I've got the SRA toolkit installed onto this system already. The program that we need to use is uh, faster Q dump. So there used to be a program called, well there still is a program called fast Q dump uh, and this is the faster version of that. So faster Q dump. Um, you should be aware that faster is only a relative term. It is far from fast. We then need to uh, give it a couple of options before it will actually download anything. The first one, which we should always use um, for uh, downloading data, is comes back to the problem that we saw before with downloading the data from the uh, interactive site, which is that if your run contains multiple files, then unless you tell it to, it won't split your results apart into multiple files. It will keep them as a single file. So we need to put on the option minus minus split files. Um, it's always useful to have something like we saw with the download from here. So with it, we can see the progress that's on there. And in the another bit of madness, uh, the people at NCBI, when they did one of the recent releases for this, managed to spell progress wrong. So it used to be right, uh, but now it's broken on here and I've submitted a patch to fix it, but it's not been applied yet. So if you wanna see the progress, you have to put minus minus progress, but spell it with one S instead of two. Uh, and then you can put in the SRR identifier and then it will download that file, okay? And it will download all of the individual read files uh, to uh, get the data for that. It might look like it's not doing anything. Uh, I found that these, uh, it starts by doing some query of a remote system at NCBI, and it can take anything from sort of 30 seconds to a minute sometimes to actually start doing anything. Once it starts downloading, it's reasonably quick, but even with the progress option, you don't see anything come up for quite a while on here. So don't think that it's not doing anything when you start this. Um, it will eventually, if you, I'll just leave that going and in a minute you'll start uh, see that come up. I've uh, got a question in the chat says, can we use the SRA toolkit uh, for data submission? Um, I'm not aware of being able to submit stuff from that, but then if I'm honest, I've never submitted stuff directly to the SRA. So we've always done our submissions through GEO, and in that, we've tended to use either an FTP or an Aspera transfer to save stuff into their uh, staging server, and then you have to submit a, a spreadsheet of metadata and there's a curation step that then goes through. So. I wouldn't like to say no, but I've certainly never used it that way. There you go, so the uh, now it's had a bit of a think. Now it's actually going to download the individual files from here and it will work its way through. There's a couple of steps that it goes through in here and that will go ahead and download the rest of the data. Now, this um, is going to have some of the problems that we've seen with uh, some of the previous solutions in that the, um, files that we get back from this uh, are 
going to just be named after the accession code. So it's just going to be called SRR5413022. FastQ.gz. Um, and we're going to have to run this command separately for each individual SRR entry. Finally, the other slightly nuts thing with this is that the data that it eventually writes to your disk is uncompressed FastQ. And uncompressed FastQ is huge. So all of the tools that work with FastQ data expect your data to be compressed. They'll normally work with uncompressed stuff, but it just takes up way more space. So after you've downloaded with FastQ dump, you're then going to need to run it through Gazip uh, to actually compress it. So as a final option to make the downloading of data from NCBI a little more palatable, I'm gonna show you one final tool. And the final tool I'm gonna to show you, I'm gonna go back to Geo. So down here at the end of the Geo entry, you get something that says raw data are available in SRA. And here there's a thing that says SRA run selector. Okay, so this is the um, tool that Geo advise you to use to sort of prepare the uh, samples that you want to download. So if I follow this link to the SRA run selector, I'll get up something that looks quite a lot like what we saw at the ENA when we looked at that, in that I get the details of the samples, and then down here I've got the individual samples that went in and some information about them. From here, we can't download the data, but we can download um, some files that will contain all of the information that we would need to be able to download it. So. I can either just directly click on this link here that says download the metadata, or if I just want some of the samples, I could pick individual samples and then click on the equivalent metadata for the selected samples. And what that will get me, if I just open this up in Notepad to start with, is something that looks like this. So it's going to be a little comma delimited file that has all of the bits of metadata, including the names and the locations and the accession codes. So what we have then built is a program where you can download this run table from the uh, SRA run selector. And if you plug that file directly into a script that I'll show you in a second, then it will then use the uh, SRA toolkit to download that data, give it sensible names and compress it so that you'll end up with a workable set of data at the end of it. So the tool that I'm going to show you with this is the SRA downloader. So this is on its GitHub page, okay, which you can see the details here. It tells you how to set it up um, and how to use it. So again, it shows you the idea that you go through the SRA run selector. You pick either the metadata from everything to get the whole sample, or you can pick individual samples and download from those. And then you can run that file through the download script and it will do all of that. Uh, so fin finally, I'm going to show you that. Okay, so this one still hasn't finished. Uh, so I will show you this in a different shell. Oh, in fact, no, I won't because it won't let me do another download whilst this one's still going. So I'm going to kill the previous FastQ dump, um, but just be aware that uh, that would have completed in the end. Let me just clean up after it because it will leave some files behind. So what I've got in here then is that SRA run table. So this is one that I downloaded before. Okay, so these are all the fields of information that you saw in that table. And then for the SRA downloader, what you, uh, you can just say SRA downloader and then the run table. Um, I'm going to specify an output file, so I can say minus minus out file, um, say BSB for bite size bioinformatics and then SRA run table. Um, if I do this, I'm going to run this, but I warn you already that it's about to fail. Uh, and, oh, uh, mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, it is going to fail, but not for the reason that I thought it was going to be. I wanted to be, I need to set the output directory, not the output file, and then it's going to fail for a different reason there. So it's going to fail because it will try to use the correct spelling of progress, which will work for older versions of the SRA toolkit and hopefully will work again in the next version of the SRA toolkit. But at the moment, because the SRA toolkit is broken because they can't spell um, progress, that you need to put for the moment an additional option which is minus minus can't spell uh, for working with versions of the toolkit that don't spell properly and now this will step through and will download all of the samples it'll find the two samples it will give them a sensible base name with the actual sequence name in it then it will run fastq dump on that to get all of the fastq files back and then it will compress those so that you'll end up with gazipped versions of all of the data that you wanted and uh, with sensible names on uh, just to show you what we'll get out i've got an example download that i completed uh, just before we started this so if I have a look at, oh, actually I can, yeah, it's the, this is the SRA downloader output. So this is what you would get out in the end where it will pull down all of the FASTQ files, give you the SRA accession, but will also give you the original sample name uh, so that you can more easily figure out what it is. So probably from a practical standpoint, I would say that the ways that I would generally do this would either be to go through uh, the SRA Explorer website to make up the script file of FTP download commands that you can plug into a script and download. That will download from the ENA uh, and will give you a nice file name straight away. Alternatively, if you go through the geo page to the uh, SRA uh, run selector, Where's that gone? Uh, here. The SRA run selector, download the metadata file for that, and then plug that into the SRA downloader script. Then that will also download all of your data in a sensible format with the right splitting of scripts, compression, and sensible file names. And either of those should be enough to then get you the data and you can work on from that point. Okay, um, so that's as much as i was going to cover today so uh, if there are any questions about this uh, well the files downloaded it says uh, keep their original read ids um so they i th they certainly have uh, sra read ids in here but i think that's because the sra has replaced them in there uh so If I just have a look at one of these, I'm pretty sure, yeah, these will have SRR read IDs, but I think the SRA does that for most of its things anyway. So if I have a look at, this, yeah, so even if we get them from EBI, it's the same thing. So they are, uh, yeah, they're, they're replaced anyway. Um, it's, it's a bit weird that, of the file size that you get for FASTQ files, a really significant proportion of that total file size is actually the identifier of the read. Um, so I think a lot of them, they now remove the headers from there and just replace them with sequential IDs because it saves on storage hugely. Any other questions from this? Um, obviously, the, if there are questions after this, we'll um, put this video up onto our YouTube channel a little bit later this afternoon. Um, and if you have other questions, you can just ask them by commenting on that video and we'll answer those there. Or people that uh, can just uh, email us directly at Baber and Bioinformatics and we're very happy to answer those. Okay, if there's no other questions then, I will uh, end the session there. Uh, thanks for coming along and uh, please come along to future Bite Size Bioinformatics sessions. Uh, there's a link to them uh, off our pages uh, where you can uh, see the future sessions. I'm not sure how many more we've actually got dates for, but there's a few that we're going to schedule in the very near future. Um, so please come along to those and thanks for coming along today. <laughs>